This concept module is on programming in geospatial technology. I'm Vince DiNoto, the director of the Geotech Center, and this set of slides will explain a little bit about programming and how we use it in geospatial technology. The purpose of this concept module is not to teach you programming or scripting, but instead to give you a functional overview of how script languages can be used in geospatial technology. When you're using a computer language discussion, you need to have a certain language to look at. And there's lots of different languages out there, and there's lots of different scripting languages out there. For our purposes, we're going to look at Python when we need to show you code as part of the examples of what different functions do for you. We're not going to go into a lot of depth about how the code works, because that would be more what you need to do actually taking a Python class or any other computer language class. In this concept module, we're going to try to make you an automator of processes and not a programmer of functions. And so what I mean by making you an automator, say you need to merge five counties together and you use that merge county boundary as a clipping tool to clip rivers out of a state file. Well, there's lots of clicks that must be done with your mouse to make that happen. But you can write that function in a matter of a few lines of code, and it will automatically do the process for you. And if you write it properly, you can just change the input variables, and it will do it for another series of counties. So this is making you an automator to make processes go quicker and not require as much clicking of a mouse um, to create what you need for this process. So we need to understand that there's a difference between software and operating systems and applications. So when we think of a computer, it must have some overarching program behind it to make it function. In the geospatial realm, when we talk about ESRI products, we generally are talking about something like Windows. It could be the Apple operating system for other purposes, but we're looking at something like Windows. An application is something like a geospatial program, a word processor, maybe a publishing tool, an image editor. Those are all applications where we're not looking at the programming language of the application, nor are we looking at the programming language of the overall operating system. We're looking at using a scripting language or a programming language inside of an application. Some programs are physically stored within the computer itself that it is within a solid state device. Other programs are stored on a hard drive, which might be a physical hard drive or a solid state hard drive, but they're start stored there. They can be deleted, added to, things like that. And so we have these different parts of the operating system. But for our sake, again, we're getting down to actually writing scripts inside of an application. So you see the word scripting used, and you see the word programming language used, and they both have similar functionality. The biggest difference is when we do a programming language, we must compile the language into a set of executable code before it can be ran to see if things are working properly. Generally with the scripting language, we can write a line of code, press enter on my keyboard, and see if that line of code is functioning properly. So you can do a line by line actual execution of the code to make sure it's working properly. And I use this word code and realize code is the same as a language or a scripting language. That is what the underlying principles are that works for us. So we have this code that we're looking at throughout. And we'll learn a little bit about coding, but not to any great degree, because that would require an extensive class to learn in-depth knowledge of code. When we write a script, a script is just a text file. So I could use something like a word processor or a text editor to write all my scripts. And then I could run those scripts with the appropriate software installed, and they would all run for me. 
but we'd like to use instead a smart editor and by using a smart editor what we refer to as an IDE gives us the ability to type part of the code and maybe the rest of the code will then automatically fall into place it will also give us some error messages to help us know when there is an issue for most computers today they run on a 64-bit operating system but there are lots of applications that were wrote for 32-bit operating systems so you must use the correct version for the software that you've got installed or the application that you have installed and also for your computer hardware so for our example Python in a 32-bit version is different than Python in a 64-bit version and they have different version numbers most scripting editors the IDEs will run in two different ways one way is just writing the script like if you're working in a text editor but with it being a smart text editor and then at the end you save it and execute the entire script the other way is to work in immediate mode that you get immediate feedback um, after you type each line of code that's not always true because every once in a while if you're doing some type of a looping function you might have to put multiple lines of code in before in immediate mode it is executed so you can see what's going on there sometimes when you have a very small editor just a typo you might get several lines of error messages and it may look like it's a major problem but all you did was make a typo in what you did so I mentioned 32 and 64-bit processors and why is a 64-bit processor much better than a 32-bit processor? Well, if you think of the inside of a computer being a bunch of on and off switches, with a 32-bit processor you have basically 32 on and off switches, like light switches. It's either turned on or it's turned off. So a 32-bit processor you can see here gives us something in the neighborhood of 4 billion combinations of on and off switches. If you look farther to your right on this slide, you'll see a 64-bit processor goes way beyond the 4 billion that we saw in a 32-bit processor. So therefore, it will run and do things in a quicker fashion in general than what you see with a 32-bit processor. So again, some applications are wrote in 32-bit, some are wrote in 64-bit, and then there are sometimes some interpreters that are wrote in between there. While I'm on this screen talking about the internals workings of your computer, we also must understand the video card can play an important role to us. So a very basic video card has what we call 8-bit depth, and we break that into three colors, red, green, and blue. And each of those colors have from 0 to 255 possible combinations. So we have 0 to 255 reds, 0 to 255 greens, 0 to 255 blues, what we call 8-bit depth. So 255 times 255 times 255 is somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 million different color combinations that we can have. This is way more than the human eye can see. There are video cards that go way beyond this in the number of colors. And there are video cards that are much faster. They have more onboard memory, and therefore they can run much faster. And somebody working in high intense graphics like we do in geospatial technology might need to have a higher end video card than just the basic video card. Application libraries are extremely important especially in Python and other scripting languages. So if you need a command, somebody else has probably already wrote the command, and you don't need to go out and write it from scratch. So if you need the command such as clipping, someone has already wrote this in a geospatial library, and we can just pull that command, put the right terms in that command, and then be able to use that command for what we need. So. Um, there are these libraries, there are mathematical libraries. The example that I've put on this slide here shows you the quadratic equation, which will give us two answers. And all you do is input the coefficients A, B, and C, and the actual code behind this has been written by somebody else. So libraries are extremely important, and we will be using libraries when we talk about 
geospatial programming. So, for example, in ArcGIS Desktop and ArcGIS Pro, there's a library called ArcPy. ArcPy has commands such as merge and clip and tabular join and spatial join and dynamic labeling. Those are all part of the commands that have already been programmed for you inside the ArcPy library. So we can then call those commands up and use those commands. We got to be careful and make sure we put the information in in the right methodology. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. So the clip function. What we do with the clip function, remember, is do we take a polygon boundary and then extract data um, that contained within that boundary. So such as a set of roads that are for the entire state, we want to get roads just for a single county, the boundary would be the county boundary and we would use um, a state road file and clip or extract the information that we want. So the command, just to give you a feel for what a command structure might look like, is in the ArcPy library if we're using the Esri products and it's called clip and then it is in the analysis toolbox. And what we normally give for a clip is the input feature, which would be the roads of the entire state for this example, the polygon feature, which would be the county boundary, and then where we're going to put the results, an output file. So we give it a new file name there and we run this single line of command and it will do the clip for us instead of having to point and click using a mouse. So you can run this single line of code as a Python script and it will give us what we need. We have to put a little bit more stuff around it to make it work properly, but pretty much one line of code will do this clipping function. File naming is critically important, both for you to be able to find your files and also for you to be able to go and use these files inside of a script. So if all the files for the state of Indiana has an IN at the beginning of it, then we could search using a script for all the IN files so we could find all the Indiana appropriate files within a script. So using a file such as noted here IN underscore rivers is a much better name than something like T0003, but that may have been the file name that we got when we downloaded the information from whatever source that we downloaded it from. So you see another one here, census tracks for Scott County, Kentucky, um, at the income is what we're looking at, um, using the five-year rolling average. So you can see we might name this file KY underscore Scott underscore census because it's at the census track level underscore ACS 2016 underscore income. I realize it's an extremely long name, but it gives us a lot of description that we can use both to find the file and know what the file contains without having to go into any great depth, but it also gives us the ability to do searching and sorting inside of our script. So again, as we're automating this process, if our files are well named, it will make our life a lot easier. It's very critical to know where you store your files. If you do not know where your data is, then you've got a problem. And it's strongly suggested that you build some type of a file structure, either using a geodatabase or using a data storage area, such as all the files from the state of Indiana is going to be under GIS data, and it's going to be in a file folder called Indiana. And then inside that file folder is going to be your geodatabase or if you have a lot of files for different counties, you then may have a subfolder under that for the counties. So it's very important that you know where your data is located, know if it's in a relational database, one that can be edited by multiple people, or if it's in a personal geo database, or is it in a regular file folder type methodology. So it's very important to understand how your data is stored and where it is stored. It's also very important to add metadata to all your files. I won't go into depth on metadata right here, but you can see our concept module on metadata to learn more about how to create metadata and the purposes of metadata. Scripting languages and computer languages all work off this concept of variables. 
And if you want to think of it going back to algebra with the variables that you did in algebra, there are some similarities there. But a variable can represent numeric values or text values. And a text value and a numerical value are, serve very, very different purposes for us. A text value is things like letters, words. Those are text values. Numerical values are things like numbers, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Those are numerical values. Numerical values such as 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 can be saved as a numerical value or it could be saved as a text value. If it's a text value, you cannot do mathematics on it, but you can only look at it within a string. So like if we we're going to use first names and I decided to use one underscore name instead of using the word first, that one is text and it is not numerical because I cannot do mathematics with it. So you can see down here we've given you an example of how you might combine two text fields together, a first name field and a last name field. And we use two quotation marks and with a blank space in there because we don't want the first name joining up in to the last name. We want a space between the first name and last name. So we have two variables, one first name, one last name. And we want to make one variable, which is the full name of the person. So we call that name. So name equals equals first underscore name plus a space plus last underscore name and therefore you can have a single name field instead of two multiple name fields. A little bit more about variables. So you can have something called a list variable. A list variable is multiple components put together. So maybe it's all the street addresses for a group of students in a class. So you would have the first student's address, a comma, another student's address, and so on. So you have a whole list of these student addresses. <clears throat> Note I named this street address with a capital A, list with a capital L, so this variable has a name that I understand what might be in it. But if I instead used a smaller or lowercase a instead of a capital A, that would be a different variable then. So if it was street lowercase a address, capital L list, that's going to be a different variable than the one street capital A address, capital L list. You got to be careful of using some special characters in some of your variables. They are not um, available to you. You also have some names that you cannot use. For example, one of the functions that we'll talk about later in this module is the if function. And the if function um, requires that we keep that as a reserved name. So you cannot make that a variable name called if because it has a certain functionality inside the scripting language. So using a list variable, it has a slightly different way of putting it together. So we use square brackets for list variables, and the list might be all the county names um, in a state. So for example, what we could do here is arcpy.merge. Merge is combining like shapes together. It's in the management toolbox, county list, output file, merge. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take all the files of a certain state that are at the county level and merge them into an output file. And so after we do that, we want to take that new file, which we called output merge, and we want to use that as a clipping file. So we're doing two functions in a row. We're merging a bunch of counties together, and then we're using that merge data immediately in the next line of code to create a clipped variable for the state for certain roads within that merged area. So they may not be for the whole state. So you do need to be careful there on how you use these. Mathematical orders of operations are things like pluses, minuses, division, multiplication, raising things to a power, and 
we have to have a hierarchy here. So multiplications and divisions are done before additions and subtractions are done. And equations are always evaluated from left to right. Let's discuss a little bit about mathematical orders of operations, see some examples of it. So if we start off with A being 1, B being 2, and C being 3, if we just add A plus B plus C together, we get a value of 6, 1 plus 2 plus 3. If we use some parentheses in a multiplication, we get a different value. So if we have inside parentheses A plus B times C, that will equal 9 because A plus B is 3, and then we take the 3 times the C value, which is 3, and that gives us a 9. If we had not used those parentheses, we'd get a different value. So if we had A plus B times C without the parentheses, we'd first do B times C, which would be 2 times 3, which would be 6, and then we'd add the value of A onto it, which would be 1. You can do the same type of things with parentheses with powers. So if we have in parentheses A plus B raised to the C power, a plus B is going to be 3. C has a value of 3. So 3 raised to the third power is 3 times 3 times 3. Again, if we did not use the parentheses, we'll see that we have A plus B times raised to the C power would be 2 to the third power, which would be 2 times 2 times 2 or 8. And then you add 1 to it, which would give you a value of 9. So you can see that there is different ways to do situations. This will end the first part of the presentation. We suggest that you go to part two to continue learning about programming and scripting in geospatial technology. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact us.